Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism by David McNally. This is Chapter 2, Part 1 of Chapter 2. Marx's Monsters, Vampire Capital, and the Nightmare World of Late Capitalism. Perseus wore a magic cap so that the monsters he hunted down might not see him. We draw the magic cap down over our eyes and ears so as to deny that there are any monsters. That was a quote from Karl Marx. Capitalism is both monstrous and magical. Crucially, its magic consists in concealing the occult economy, the obscure transactions between human bodies and capital on which it rests. Entranced by this sorcery, the equivalent of magic caps pulled over our eyes and ears, bourgeois common sense vigorously denies the monsters in our midst. But as with all anxious denials, what has disappeared performs a return to the repressed. Deprived of a palpable reality, vampires, werewolves, and zombies nevertheless amble across movie and television screens and through the pages of pulp fiction. To be sure, these are pale substitutes, faint and distorted after images of the monsters we deny. Subjected to the ritual codes of a culture industry, these are domesticated beasts, beings derived from the collective unconscious in order to produce harmless items of mass consumption. Part of the genuine radicalism of Marx's critical theory resides in its insistence on tracking and naming the monsters of modernity. Where critical theory abdicates knowledge of the monstrous, it invariably reduces its agenda to amelioration, to polite suggestions for more civil communication. In so doing, it renounces its own critical impulses. It is only in staring horrors in the face and insisting on their systemic, not accidental character that theory sustains radical commitments. This is why Marx's capital overflows, as, as we shall see, with detailed narratives of the monstrous outrages of capital. Factories in which Dante would have found the worst horrors in his inferno surpassed, unrelenting traffic in human flesh, the turning of children's blood into capital the crippling of body and mind of the workers, the extirpation, enslavement, and entombment in minds of the indigenous population of the Americas, the conversion of Africa into a preserve for the commercial hunting of black skins, the vampire that will not let go while there remains a single muscle, sinew, or drop of blood to be exploited. To name these horrors is also to perform a counter magic to the sorcery of capitalism, or of capital. For capital's great powers of illusion lie in the way it invisibilizes its own monstrous formation. In endeavoring to pull off the magic cap of modernity, Marx sought a confrontation with monstrosity. He set out to reveal the legions of vampires and werewolves that inhere in capital so that they might be banished. Yet across much ostensibly critical theory today, the beasts have fled the field or rather they have given way to the ceremonial fiends of the culture industries. Where this occurs, radical theory too enters into complicity with the monster denial that marks modern consciousness. Perhaps fittingly, it is in a novel by an indigenous writer of the Americas that we discover a uniquely perceptive treatment of Marx's monsters. Working in an imaginative space generated by the clash of native peoples in the Americas with capitalist modernity, Leslie Marmon Silko mines Marx's images of monstrosity for the work of remembering and resisting. To this end, her novel, Almanac of the Dead, traces the political awakening of an aboriginal woman, Angelita La Escapia, through her encounter with Marx's capital. Marx was the first white man Le Escapia had ever heard call his own people vampires and monsters. But Marx had not stopped with accusations. Marx caught the capitalists of the British Empire with bloody hands. Marx backed every assertion with evidence, coroner's reports with gruesome stories about giant spinning machines that consumed the limbs and lives of the small children working in factories. On and on Marx went, describing the tiny corpses of children who had been worked to death. 
tribal people had had all the experience they would ever need to judge whether Marx's stories told the truth. The Indians had seen generations of themselves ground into bloody pulp under the wheels of ore cars in crumbling tunnels of gold mines. Marx had never forgotten the indigenous people of the Americas or of Africa. Marx had recited the crimes of slaughter and slavery committed by the European colonials who had been sent by their capitalist slave masters to secure the raw materials of capitalism, human flesh and blood. Silko reads Marx as a great storyteller in search of the powers with which to cure the suffering and evils of the world, Marx had understood stories are alive with the energy words generate, she writes. Word by word, the stories of suffering, injury, and death arouse the living with fierce passion and determination for justice. Marx's tarrying with monstrosity, with werewolves and the mangled bodies of dead children, with vampires and the slaughtered remains of indigenous peoples, functions for Silco as considerably more than rhetorical flourish. In her reading, it fulfills critical theory's obligation to give voice to suffering. With Marx, she asserts that the essence of capitalist monstrosity is its transformation of human flesh and blood into raw materials for the manic machinery of accumulation. Rather than merely provocative metaphors, then, Marx's monsters are signs of horror, markers of the real terrors of modern social life. All too often, this dimension of Marx's thought has vanished from sight, along with the monsters he detailed. Part of the problem is that Marx sought a new language, literary as well as theoretical, a radical poetics through which to read capitalism. Legions of commentators have failed to appreciate this, attempting instead to reduce Marx's language to prior conceptual orders, to the categories of classical political economy or German philosophy or to those of subsequent philosophical perspectives, such as structuralism or post-structural linguistics. In so doing, they have exiled whatever does not fit these theoretical discourses, declaring it to be inconsistent, undeveloped, and unacceptable. Louis Althusser, for instance, famously claimed that the more historical and empirical sections of capital devoted to detailed analyses of capitalist industry and to workers' struggles against machinery and over the length of the working day, obeyed a logic at odds with the theoretical sections of the text, an interpretation which has enjoyed a wide influence. And even where they eschew such dualistic claims, numerous critics have simply assumed that, in deciphering the theoretical structure of capital, they could safely ignore Marx's ethno ethnography of working class experience illuminated as it is by extended historical discussions, literary references, copious empirical documentation, and explicitly dramatic constructions. Yet all such interpretive strategies fall short. Far from textual adornment, Marx's literary stylistics and empirical analyses, the very places where we most often encounter monsters, are integral elements of his conceptual schema. Rather than marks of inconsistency or superfluous ornaments, Marx's persistent shifts in register and idiom from complex theoretical mappings of the commodity to metaphorically charged descriptions of the crippling effects of capitalist production on workers' bodies reflect deeply held views about his object of study, the capitalist mode of production, and about the adequate theoretical protocols for tracking and demystifying it. Because capitalism constitutes an alienated, topsy-turvy world, one in which phenomena regularly appear upside down, the theoretical discourse that maps it needs to mimic the wild movement of things so as to better expose it. This is especially important given the way that capitalist inversions become normalized for everyday thought and action. As a result, like Brecht, Marx seems to estrange us from the familiar so that we might actually see it for what it is. To this end, he requires a dialectical language of doublings and reversals. Dialectics and the Doubled Life of the Commodity Amongst other things, dialectical thought is distinguished by the notion that theoretical analysis and exposition are not extrinsic to the object of knowledge. As opposed to external cognition, which imposes a predetermined method on what it seeks to understand, dialectics proceeds by way of imminent criticism, 
aspiring to trace the internal movement and structure of its object of study. Rather than bringing a phenomenon under its demand, dialectical investigations are shaped by the characteristics of the object being explored. This makes dialectical analyses literally phenomenological exercises in explicating the internal logic of phenomena. An approach of this sort creates unique problems, however, where the object of investigation does not obey conventional logics. How, for instance, do we analyze a phenomenon that observes magical transformations in which material things turn immaterial and vice versa? In grappling with such problems, Marx developed the multifaceted strategy of exposition and presentation to which I have alluded. To be sure, such strategies are not entirely unique to Marx. One commentator on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit remarks, for instance, that the book is filled with jokes, puns, wisecracks, sarcasm, parody, and all those ingredients which tend to make an academic work not serious. Such features are not mere idiosyncrasies of personal style. Instead, they are integral to the dialectical quest for a language and imagery with which to track the doublings and inversions of phenomena. Marx's capital, too, as many critics have observed, overflows with symbolism, metaphors, ironic barbs, and a stunning range of allusions to world literature. Yet, whereas Hegel has been decreed as a horrible writer whose phenomenology was composed in utter haste, Marx was an exceptional stylist whose great work is a literary as well as a theoretical and political masterpiece. We should thus see his textual presentation as deeply considered as a deliberate part of his theoretical strategy. More than this, Marx's need for a unique theoretical language was more pressing than was Hegel's. After all, Marx recognized that the doublings of capitalist society are more than the stuff of irony. They are also the grounds of mystery, the mystery of commodities and of horror, whose presence dominates his chapter on the working day and his analysis of the prehistory or primitive accumulation of capital. Even more than Hegel's phenomenology, then, capital overflows with features that tend to make an academic work make an academic work not serious. Outrage, irony, sarcasm, moral condemnation, gothic imagery, overtly dramatic constructions. Rather than stylistic ornamentations, these features are, I insist, essential aspects of Marx's text, integral means for the expression of his core theoretical arguments. Determined that his critique of political economy should form a dialectically articulated artistic whole, Marx labored painstakingly over its presentation. His surgically delivered irony, his references to werewolves and vam vampires, his deployment of Shakespeare, Dante, Cervantes, and Goethe were all deeply considered parts of his effort to define the mysteries of capitalist social life. While most commentators fail to grasp this point, a handful of critics have appreciated something of Marx's stylistic achievements. Reading Capital as a work of imagination, Edmund Wilson, for instance, argued that Marx is certainly the greatest ironist since Swift. And turning to the argumentative strategy at work in Capital, he observes, the meaning of the impersonal looking formulas which Marx produces with so scientific an air is, he reminds us from time to time, as if casually, pennies withheld from the worker's pocket, sweat squeezed out of his body, and natural enjoyments denied his soul. In competing with the pundits of economics, Marx has written something in the nature of a parody. He then continues with respect to the structure of the text. In Marx, the exposition of the theory, the dance of commodities, the cross-stitch of logic, is always followed by a documented picture of the capitalist laws at work, and these chapters, with their piling up of factory reports, their prosaic descriptions of misery and filth, their remorseless enumeration of the abnormal conditions to which the men, women, and children of the working class have had to try to adjust themselves, these at last become intolerable. We feel that we have been taken for the first time through the real structure of our civilization, and that it is the ugliest that has ever existed. Stanley Edgar Hyman, who also reads Capital as imaginative literature, notes that its poetic texture is an amazing richness of image, symbol, and metaphor. 
Arguing that the text's basic form is dramatic, Hyman too observes its doubled structure, remarking that the book's periodic descents into the horrors of capitalism are spaced so that each comes as a fresh shock, and each is followed by a deliberate flatness, what Stendhal called benches for my readers to sit down on. While less attentive to the alternating movements of the text, Anne uh, Svetkovich too argues for a dramatic reading of Capital as a sensation narrative, one that pivots on the aches and pains of the laboring work worker's body. These observations are replete with insights concerning Marx's powerful use of parody to the alternating structure of his text as it jolts back and forth between theoretical abstraction and detailed, often horrifying empirical description, particularly of the torments of the laboring body. Yet, as much as they intuit something of its dramatic structure, these authors flounder badly with respect to the core theoretical arguments of capital. As a result, each severs the theoretical from the stylistic, choosing to assess Marx in predominantly aesthetic terms. One of my objects in what follows is to read Marx's theory and his stylistics together, to show the interconnection between the method of exposition and his theoretical mapping of the commodity form. This involves attending to Marx's persistent use of body imagery in his account of the commodity and to the dialectical reversals of the material and the immaterial that he locates at the very heart of value. Tracing dialectical reversals, as I argue capital does, requires a continual flow of metaphor. Again, this corresponds to the nature of the object of investigation, since Marx deciphered the ontology of capitalism as literally metaphorical, as, co as constituting a social order in which some things regularly stand in for, substitute themselves for, other things. The term metaphor derives, of course, from the idea of transfer or translation. Marx's use of the term reflects this meaning, as it does the Shakespearean deployment of metaphors as powerful rhetorical figures, in which one thing, idea, or action is referred to by the name of another. Great lover of Shakespeare's texts that he was, Marx uses similar technique to depict the behavior of commodities in capitalist society. Capitalism, he argues, comprises a society in which commodities announce their value in and through something else. Units of money. The particular value of a commodity is thus referred to by the name of another. In this metaphorical structure of substitutions, where one thing, money, stands in for another, a specific commodity, there lies a special universe of alienation and exploitation. Indeed, there is an element of Gothic horror in these displacements, involving, as they do, a doubling process in which the truth of one thing or agent can only be arrived at through another, which stands in opposition to it, much as Victor Frankenstein's truth is embodied in his hostile creature. Marx's persistent use of metaphors, literary references, and Gothic imagery are thus strategies for theorizing the doublings and transpositions that occur in a world governed by capital. That such displacements and doublings are monstrous is hinted at in the first sentence of Capital, where Marx announces that the wealth of capitalist society first presents itself as an immense collection of commodities. The English translation fails to capture the full import of Marx's formulation, for the word here translated as immense also means monstrous. And Marx would appear to be playing on these multiple meanings, preparing his readers for the idea that the wealth of capitalist society takes on a life of its own and comes by an unsettling reversal to, dominates, to dominate its creators. Precisely this is what he tells us in his notebooks for capital, where he describes capitalist wealth as a monstrous objective power. But what does it mean to suggest that goods designed to satisfy human needs and desires can be monstrous? Such a statement is merely rhetorical unless commodities are something more than items for satisfying human wants. In analyzing this something more, we begin to apprehend the double structure of the commodity. There is nothing original in the observation that Marx describes 
the commodity is doubled. From the outset of Capital, he tells us that commodities are a contra contradictory unity of use value and exchange value. As use value, commodities meet human needs. But as exchange values, they obey a different imperative to procure other goods or their universal representative, money, in order to augment the wealth of their owners. Capitalism, as Marx demonstrates, is entirely about the latter process raised to the nth degree. It is about commodity exchange for purposes of endlessly accumulating abstract universal wealth, money, as opposed to specific use values. The pursuit of ever expanding exchange value or as Marx refers, ve prefers value, speaks to an invisible, immaterial quality of commodities. After all, no commodity can undertake an infinite physical expansion. Its material features, through which it satisfies specific human wants, are finite. No matter how many of these goods we might imagine, they still inhabit the world of material limits. But taken as values, commodities are, in principle, infinitely expansive, since there is no inherent limit to the monetary wealth their owner, seller, might accumulate. It was in these terms that Aristotle distinguished unnatural acquisition of goods from natural acquisition, whereas the latter household economy acquires goods for their use and thus observes natural limits. Crematis, or crema, crematistics drives beyond all limits, seeking an unlimited accumulation of wealth, money, but to do this, to push beyond all physical limits, capital must accumulate an aspect of the commodity that is immaterial, invisible, and intangible. Not an atom of matter enters in the, into the objectivity of commodities as values, writes Marx. We may twist and turn a single commodity as we wish. It remains impossible to grasp it as a thing possessing value. And here we encounter the monstrously doubled form of the commodity that endows it, with metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. Let us take Marx's initial example of commodity exchange, 20 yards of linen equals one coat. Here he tells us the value of a certain quantity of linen is expressed in something else, a coat. Yet there is no property of coatness that resides in linen. There must be an unseen similarity, a common property not accessible to the senses, which makes these commodities commensurable. We can see the nature of this problem more clearly if we expand the initial formula so as to express the value of linen in quantities of coats or tea or iron or gold or shoes and so on. Then we get a formula like 20 yards of linen equals one coat, 10 pounds of tea, 0 0.5 tons of iron, two ounces of gold, one pair of shoes. Here it becomes clear that exchange relations cannot possibly be based on the physical or natural properties of these goods since the universe of all possible commodities is simply too diverse and variegated for all of them to share common material characteristics. Instead, what the coat expresses about the linen, its value, rep represents a supernatural property, something that transcends sensuousness. This invisible property constitutes the phantom-like objectivity of value and the supersensuous characteristic they share has to do with their being products of human labor in the abstract, labor considered in abstraction from everything that makes it concrete, discrete, and individual. When we equate coats, linen, and gold, therefore, we are equating weaving, spinning, and mining, each of which is a qualitatively distinct work process. We are saying that each of these unique labor processes however much they differ concretely as productive activities, creating distinct use values, have produced the same intangible thing, a certain quantity of value measurable by money. The capitalist market must abstract, therefore, from all of the qualitative features of these work processes in order to equate them as quantities of the same thing, homogeneous and interchangeable labor. What capitalism does, therefore, is to construct the values of products of labor on the basis of an unseen and intangible property they share as commodities, but not as use values, that of being general products of human labor abstracted from the concrete work processes involved. 
The capitalist economy thus affects a real abstraction in which products become bearers of an invisible substance, value, and concrete labor becomes the bearer of labor in the abstract. Indifference toward the specific content of labor is not only an abstraction made by us, it is also made by capital, and it belongs to its essential character. But a system of abstract labor can only come into being if real concrete laborers are compelled to produce for the market rather than for use. And this happens systematically only where the activity of labor has been alienated from the laborer, only where labor is controlled, regulated, and directed by capitals that are obeying the dictates of the market to produce at socially necessary labor times or faster. This is what it means to say that capitalism operates by way of a real abstraction. The very life activity of workers is detached or abstracted from them. In claiming that capitalism is organized on the basis of abstract labor, Marx would thus seem to have the literal sense of the word in mind. The Latin root of the verb to abstract means to draw away or literally to separate, detach, cut off. And capitalism performs precisely this separating, dissecting, and alienating operation when it abstracts from the concrete and specific individuals who perform unique productive, ta or productive acts, treating all work as effectively identical and interchangeable, as quanta of the same undifferentiated abstract substance. Moreover, inherent in the operations of these processes of real abstraction is a whole structure of mystification. To illustrate this structure, Marx takes the mundane example of a table. He notes that, as a use value, there is nothing mysterious about a table, since it has observable properties that make it humanly useful. He continues, The form of wood, for instance, is altered if a table is made out of it. Nevertheless, the table continues to be wood, an ordinary sensuous thing. But as soon as it emerges as a commodity, a good produced for purposes of exchange, it changes into a thing that transcends sensuousness, and not only stands with its feet on the ground, but in relation to all other commodities, it stands on its head and evolves out of its wooden brain grotesque ideas, far more wonderful than it, if it were to begin dancing of its own free will. Closely attending to this remarkable passage, which has rarely been given the attention it deserves, allows us to grasp the metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties with which the commodity bounds. As a good produced for exchange rather than use, commodity, says Marx, stands on its head. As much as it may look and feel like a table, it is in fact something else, a repository of universal exchangeability, of human labor in the abstract ultimately um, uh, ultimately measurable in a quantum of money its sensuousness or its sensuous qualities are in principle irrelevant to its function as a means to monetary accumulation in declaring itself as such the table advances grotesque ideas i.e monstrous thoughts it proclaims itself to be something non-sensuous something with universal properties exchangeability with all other commodities rather than finite particular ones, such as those of wood fashioned into a table. Without this capacity to transcend its sensuousness, the table could never be anything more than a use value. It could not assume the doubled form of a commodity. If it is to enter into the world of commodity exchange, it must shed its tableness and reemerge as a sum of money. And money is not any one thing. It is the means of having everything. Tables, iron, tea, cotton, and so on. It is simultaneously all and therefore none, and every commodity must be capable of this transformation out of specificity as a use value and into abstract generality as a value in exchange, a sum of money, upon entering a world in which commodities stand on their heads and evolve monstrous ideas. We thus move into the spectral world of value, the, initial, the initially doubled form of the commodity as use value and exchange value now generates yet further doublings, as the following schema indicates. Um, there's a chart here. So the doublings it shows, so commodity, um, use value, and exchange value, 
material and immaterial, sensuous and non-sensuous, visible and invisible, concrete and abstract, body and soul or spirit. In order to make sense of all this, particularly the last of these doublings, body, soul, which has received remarkably little attention in the critical literature, let us return to Marx's famous value equation, 20 yards of linen equals one coat. When we equate the value of linen with that of a coat, says Marx, the coat counts only as the body of value. Something immaterial and non-sensuous. Value is being expressed in and measured by something material, a specific use value, such as coat. Marx continues, the value of the linen is therefore expressed by the physical body of the commodity coat. But in recognizing itself in the coat, the linen sees something other than its material, sensuous coatness. Instead, alongside its sensuous characteristics, it recognizes the coat as a bearer of value. Or, more dramatically, what the linen acknowledges in the coat is the soul of value. Now, this is quite peculiar language. It is also far from haphazard. Turning subsequently to the problem of the measure of value and using an analogy with, with weight, Marx chooses to illustrate his point with iron, referring to the bodily form of the iron. He informs us that the iron counts as a body and proceeds to link the roles played by the body of the iron and the body of the coat. So deliberate is this language that we find it reproduced, e.g. le corps d'une marchandise in the first French edition of Capital. The only translation whose publication Marx oversaw. Having pushed this comparison, Marx abruptly declares the limits of his own analogy. Used as a measure of weight, iron represents a natural property, whereas the body of the coat, as a measure of value, represents a supernatural property, what he has earlier described as the soul of value. This strange language of body and soul is, I submit, both ironic and deeply serious. Marx urges that value, a spectral entity whose objectivity is phantom-like, can only express itself through the material bodies of commodities, including, as we shall see, the bodies of those who bear the commodity labor power. Commodities thus inhabit a world of magic and necromancy, in which sensuous things, use values, are mysteriously transformed into entities of an altogether different order, values, as if by alchemy. Through these reversals, material goods metamorphose into bearers of something ghostly. More sinister, the, sur the survival of people depends upon their worth in these ghostly terms. Since the capitalist form of wealth, value, is disembodied, a, phantas a phantasmal entity that lives and grows only by taking possession of the bodies of commodities. Individuals are now ruled by abstractions, says Marx. It comes as a little surprise, then, that the monstrous entity to which the most frequently frequently to which he most frequently likens capital is the vampire. But before pursuing this point, let us explore further the idea of value as something phantom like, which returns us to Marx's theory of the fetishism of commodities. <clears throat> the specter the specter of value and the fetishism of commodities. As I discuss further in the next chapter, the European discourse of the fetish emerged as a means of marking Africans as primitives who superstitiously attributed divine powers to brute things. Yet in a powerfully ironic act of inversion, the young Marx turned the charge of fetish worship back on the European ruling class declaring that it was they who bowed down before objects. Gold in the case of the Spanish colonizers of the Americas, and wood where the rulers of the Rhineland were concerned. Rather than the, the rationalists they proclaimed themselves to be, urged Marx, Europe's rulers in fact idolized things. Worse, in their plundering mania for things like gold and silver, their fetishism takes on murderous proportions. Much of the critical charge of this argument derives from its strategy of reversal, revealing the, primitive, the primitivism attributed to Africans as a projection of European attitudes and behaviors. But as he developed his systematic critique of political economy, Marx observed a further irony. 
more than a religion of sensuous desire, a fantastic devotion to things, commodity fetishism at its deepest level is a religion of non-sensuous desire. However much capitalists bow down before things, their true God is immaterial. Rather than desire things for their material properties, capitalists actually seek that invisible and immaterial property they share, value. After all, it is only their property as products of human labor in the abstract, labor stripped of all material specificity, which makes commodities commensurable and exchangeable with money. But this means that value, the entity worshipped by capitalists, is entirely invisible, intangible, an actual power whose objectivity is purely phantasmal. As Peter Stellenbrass shows, there is a compelling irony at work in this line of argument. To fetishize commodities is, in one of Marx's least understood jokes, he writes, to reverse the whole history of fetishism, for it is to fetishize the invisible, the immaterial, the suprasensible. This observation underlines the originality of Marx's argument. Fetishism is typically understood as a form of object worship. In the history of Protestantism, to fetishize is to worship mere things, such as icons or statues, rather than God. In liberal political po philosophy, human subjects fetishize when they abnegate their autonomy by obeying the dictates of things, rather than acting as free moral subjects. As he developed his critique of political economy, however, Marx turned his attention to the nature of the human, the human subjects promoted by liberalism, arguing that they are, in fact, hollow vessels, ideal types without social content, abstracted from their actual social circumstances so that they might be equated with each other. Just as the capitalist market abstracts from the concrete character of the use values that enter into exchange, liberalism abstracts from the real and unequal relations of society so as to endow each individual with a formal, hence empty, equality. Liberalism and German idealist philosophy thus enact a kind of idolatry, even more preposterous than reverence of sensible things. Worship of an abstraction, a subject that lacks all content and substantiality. As he developed his critique of political economy, Marx came to extend this line of argument, constructed with respect to German idealism to the value relations that drive the world of commodities. As we have seen, the value of commodities on capitalist markets has nothing to do with their sensible and material features. If it did, then radically dis dissimilar goods could not exchange with each other. It cannot be measured on the same scale, via money. Yet despite their radical dissimilarities, any and all goods in a capitalist economy can have a monetary price, a marker of their universal exchangeability. Value must therefore be something immaterial, something all commodities share irrespective of their sensible differences. So when we fetishize commodities, as Stellabras observes, we attribute extraordinary powers to an immaterial substance. However much we may confuse the value of things with their material being, which results in the crude materialism typically associated with commodity fetishism, we are in fact bowing down before something spectral, a practice infinitely more absurd than the worship of material things. Since value transcends sensuousness, its fetishization, fetishization results in the idealist capitalist contempt for the concrete, the sensuous, and the embodied. As in religion, so in capitalist society, the material world is subordinated to non-material powers, bodies subordinated to spirits, the body of value colonized by the soul of value. In this respect, value operates similarly to the way the theoretical concept behaves in idealist philosophy as a universal abstraction that substitutes for the concrete particulars of life. Consider, for instance, a memorable passage from the Holy Family, attacking the speculative procedures of critical criticism, Marx parodies them as follows. If from real apples, pears, strawberries, and almonds, I form the general idea of fruit, if I go further and imagine that my abstract idea of fruit derives from real fruit, it is an entity existing outside me is indeed the true essence of the pear, apple, etc. 
Then, in the language of speculative philosophy, I am declaring that fruit is the substance of the pear, apple, almond, etc. I am saying, therefore, that to be a pear is not essential to the pear, that to be an apple is not essential to the apple, that what is essential to all these things is not their real existence, perceptible to the senses, but the essence I have abstracted from them and then foisted on them, the essence of my idea, fruit. I therefore declare apples, pears, almonds, etc. to be mere forms of existence, modi, of fruit. My speculative reason declares these sensuous differences in inessential and irrelevant. It sees in the apple the same as the pear. By the time he wrote his mature critique of political economy, Marx had concluded that value actually operates the way idealist speculation reasons by constantly abstracting from the concretely sensuous in order to endow abstractions with being, substance, reality. He therefore deciphered a hom homolo homology between the language of speculative reason and the language of commodities. This is what makes it meaningful to describe the capitalist mode of production as a system of real abstraction, an inverted, topsy-turvy world. We see something of this homology between capital and speculative reason in a passage like the following. If I state that coats or boots stand in relation to linen because the latter is the universal incarnation of abstract human labor, the absurdity of the statement is self-evident. Nevertheless, when the producers of coats and boots bring these commodities into a relation with linen or with gold and silver, and this makes no difference here, as the universal equivalent, the relation between their own private labor and the collective labor of society appears to them in exactly this absurd form. We once again encounter the limits of English translation here. The term verrucht, translated as absurd, equally signifies crazy or deranged, while die verrucktheit implies craziness, lunacy. Indeed, an older English translation of capital used just these terms, rendering the world in the first sentence or rendering the worlds in the first sentence fuck rendering the words in the first sentence quoted above as the craziness of the statement and those in the last sentence as the same deranged form marx clearly wants to suggest that there is something crazy at work where coats boots and linen are transformed into repositories in a, of an invisible substance human labor in the abstract and by viewing this displacement as deranged, Marx's critique of fetishism moves, as we have seen, on a track quite different from the Protestant attack on idolatry. In treating things and the products of human labor as artificial and, impu and impure, Protestantism fetishizes the, immat the immaterial. God. Capital observes the same logic by substituting value, money, as the real God. The result is, is fetishization of something spectral, non-sensuous, immaterial. Nevertheless, crude materialism, a fetishization of things qua things, re-emerges as a component part of the fetishism of commodities. After all, value can only exist by inhabiting or possessing things and bodies, since only actual concrete goods can exchange with one another. The result is a dialectical reversal into vulgar materialism, a worship of objects. It is this aspect of commodity fetishism that is seized on exclusively in many accounts, accounts which miss the more complex mappings of fetishism that Marx sketches. In his discussion of critical criticism, Marx traced a similar slippage, arguing that it too eventually seeks some semblance of real content by returning from the abstraction fruit to diverse ordinary real fruits but that this return to the real can only occur in a speculative, mystical fashion. And to mystify real objects is to fetishize them qua objects, to imagine value as an immediate product of nature. This alternation between wild idealism and crude materialism was familiar to the young Marx from the time of his early critique of Hegel's political philosophy. Although intent on showing that the truth of existence lies on the side of thought, Hegel's idealism also seeks to explain the world as a whole. And this commitment to explaining the totality of existence forced him to return to nature and relations amongst material things and human agents. 
As with value in capitalist society, the flight from the real, from things, embodiment in human practice, cannot be sustained. As soon as it needs content, Hegel's philosophy has no option but to topple back to earth. But having tried to absorb the world of nature and human social practices into thought, this return to the real takes the form of a collapse. Rather than a dialectically mediated relationship, it reverts to a crudely immediate one, attempting to give some institutional ballast to the state in order to supply its ideal form with some actual content. Hegel reverts to the crudest naturalism, rooting the state in inheritance of the throne through the bloodline of the, of the royal family. He thus surrenders, as Marx puts it, to zoology, leaving us with a theory where nature creates political rulers in the same fashion in which it creates eyes and noses. The idealist search for concreteness, for some actual living substance in which to ground the state, generates into the crassest materialism in which nature takes revenge on Hegel for the attempt he has shown her. Oh, the contempt he has shown her. Marx would subsequently locate the same alternation between wild idealism and crude materialism at the heart of commodity fetishism. <clears throat> While capital insists that it is all and that the material world of nature and humans counts for nothing, it ultimately reverses itself, fixating naturalistically and one-sidedly on the very objects it has scorned. To truly abandon the world of nature and human material practice would signal its death. Capital, as Marx explains, lives and expands only through purchase and sale of commodities. It thus undergoes a set of transformations, a circuit in which commodity is sold for money, which is then used to purchase further commodities. Marx figures this circuit as MCM, where M denotes money and C commodities. Yet this circuit only makes sense in, a capital, in capitalist terms if the second M has greater value than the initial one. When this in, with, with, with this in mind, Marx rewrites his formula as MCM, where M is greater than M. Capital is thus continually in motion, says Marx, assuming at different moments the forms of commodities and money. It is not reducible to any one of these forms, however. Instead, it is their dy dynamic unity, value that immaterial stuff at the heart of capitalism, thus assumes successive material forms only to abandon them. In the circulation MCM, both the money and the commodity function only as different modes of existence of value itself. It is constantly changing from one form into another without becoming lost in this movement. It thus becomes transformed into an automatic subject. For all its ghostly objectivity, value flourishes only by attaching itself to, by temporarily possessing, entities whose objectivity is appreciably more palpable. But this attachment takes the form of a grotesque doubling, as the soul of value strives to capture the bodies of value, to possess them, and to evacuate them of all sensibility and concreteness, indeed to suck the life from them in the case of living labor. Marx portrays this vampire-like possession as positively demonic. Its consequence is a nightmare world in which the products of past labor, labor come to dominate living labor. Vast agglomerations of factories and machines compose an automated system in perpetual motion, relentlessly sucking up surplus labor, draining the life energies from laboring bodies. Capital Marx intones assumes the form of an animated monster which begins to work as if its body were by love possessed. <laughs>